I love the words of that song. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. And you know what? There are people in this room tonight and you have a dream in your heart. But for some of you, it's like somewhere over the rainbow. It's like somewhere in lullaby land. It's like, yeah, you know, God can use so-and-so and God can do that through so-and-so. But I believe that there are dreams in this place tonight that are going to take on a reality. It's going to be birthed from your heart. Come on, somebody say amen. Because, and I, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to share some, I'm just going to share my heart with you. You know, it's okay to dream. You know, and some of you have been dreaming and some of you have been sharing your dream with the wrong people. Just check out what happened to Joseph. <laughs> he said to his brothers, you know what? You're all going to bow down to me. No, you, 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 you know what I mean? Sometimes when you have a dream from God, it's best to shut your mouth for a bit. Because sometimes you can share your dream with the wrong people and sometimes you get a bunch of people that feel their dreams have been robbed and so they want to rob yours too. But I believe there are dreams in this place. In, at various stages. We are here. This building is the result of a dream that God put in Joshua's heart. And, uh, you know, I, you, you're never too old to stop dreaming. I, I, I turned 70 last month. And, no, oh yeah, I know. It's amazing. Uh, I know every woman's dream. And I, I, I was 70. I was 70 <laughs> I was, I don't work out, this is natural. I, I, and I was 70 last, last you know, and, and, and like people say to me, Ray, when are you going to retire? What a stupid question. Imagine asking the Apostle Paul, hey Paul, when are you going to retire? What? When my head falls off, when I'm done, when every single dream that God has put in my heart has been birthed and materialized, that's when I'm going to go home. Come on, somebody say amen. Paul said, I finished. Every dream that God's put in my heart, I've given birth to. And I believe, do you know what? I, I am 70 years of age and I still have dreams. I still have dreams to be birthed. And so, you know, I, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was a little bit younger, um, in my teenage years, that was in the 60s, that's pre-cassette days. Someone is saying to their friend, what's a cassette? Uh, this is vinyl days. This is, anybody remember vinyl days? I don't feel so alone here now. So yes, the vinyl days, 1966. Uh, this is this is close to when Noah finished building the ark, and uh, and I, me and my brother, I was 17, my brother was 14, and we had a dream of being pop stars. We wanted girls to scream our name. They they scream. <laughs> They're still screaming my name, but for the wrong reasons right now. But, but, they, they, but, but we, had this, we had this dream. That we, so we would, we, would, we, would, uh, we, would, we would go into the bathroom because it was a natural echo in the bathroom. Everybody sounds great in the bathroom. Even your grandfather singing somewhere over the rainbow sounds good in the, in the bathroom. And we are singing in the bathroom. And... Uh, and, and we, we had a dream one day we were going to be singing, you know, as pop stars. And we had this dream and we were singing in the bathroom. And, and this guy was passing our house and he was a recording buff. So he heard my brother and I sing in the bathroom. So he came in and he knocked the door. And he said to my mother, he said, who, what's that? Who, who are those boys singing? And my mother said, well, they're my boys. And they're singing upstairs in the bathroom. They're good singers. And he said, can I record them? So she said, yeah. So we went over to his house and we recorded the song and he said, I'm going to send it to London. And lo and behold, this is quite amazing. Uh, we, se <laughs> we sent 
a demo, uh, like a, a demo sort of song up to London to a record company called the Decca Record Company. Uh, the Decca Record Company was like the Sony of today. It was the biggest. So we sent and they wrote back immediately and they said, we want to sign up these boys and we want to give them a recording contract. My God, can you imagine me and my brother? We think all the girls are going to scream. That's all we were concerned about. The girls screaming our names. And this is the wild thing. So the Beatles at the same time, just before us, they sent in a recording to Decca and they said no. Robbie and Ray sent in a demo. They said, yes, the biggest mistake Decca Records ever made in their life right there. But we had a dream. We had a dream. And when you're young, you dream sometimes. When you get older, you tend to lose the dream. But no, man, we recorded the song. It, it came out. We had a band. We toured for five years. And ladies and gentlemen, there did come a time when we got on stage and they screamed our name. Oh, our dream was realized. But uh, th that didn't really fill the emptiness in our life. So, but dreams. Man, many of you have dreams for your life. But like the song... You believe it's somewhere over the rainbow, somewhere in the realm of fantasy, somewhere in a land you've heard about. Or is it? I, you know what? When I started thinking about this whole theme, I started to read up about things. Now, I'm going to read you a couple of things. This is quite amazing. Uh, let, let me show you the power of a dream, okay? So there's a guy called Larry Walters, and he lived in Los Angeles in California, and he had a dream, his boyhood dream was to fly. Oh man, he wanted to fly, but because of something, he went for the tests, and, uh, and because of his eyesight, uh, they disqualified him for the job of ever being a pilot. So uh, he was discharged from the military, and he, and he just sat in the backyard, you know, just believing his dream was shattered. And he'd be looking up into the sky, seeing the, the planes fly overhead and thinking, what could have been, you know? And he's sitting in his lawn chair, in his garden chair. And then all of a sudden, see, see, see a, a dream, uh, it takes a long time for a dream to die. And this dream was still alive in him, even though he'd been rejected. So he sat in the garden looking at these planes and he's sitting in his garden chair and he had this amazing idea. So he called his friend and he said, listen, I got an idea. Let's go down to the local army and navy store. And he bought 45 weather balloons and he tied them to his chair. He filled them, they were four foot in diameter and he filled them with helium. 40, he had a dream to fly. So we tied 45 helium balloons, four foot in diameter, to his garden chair. He strapped himself in. <laughs> and then he took some sandwiches. And, and he took, and he took a, a, a BB gun, a slug gun. With, he had, so he had sandwiches, he had a can of beer, and a slug gun. Because the idea was... When he floated up about 30 feet or something, to get back down again, he would just shoot the balloons. What a great idea, but his dream was to fly. you got to give it to Larry. So he strapped himself in, and when it says here, when his friend cut the cord, anchoring down the lawn chair, he didn't float lazily up to 30 feet. He shot up like a, like, a, like a shot from a cannon. And, 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 and the lift of the 45 helium balloons holding 33 cubic feet of helium, he didn't, <laughs> he didn't level off at 100 foot. He didn't even level off at 1,000 feet after climbing. <laughs> And climbing and climbing, he leveled off at 16,000 feet in a lawn chair 
with a BB gun, a can of beer, and some ham sandwiches. Now, at that height, he felt that he couldn't risk shooting any of the balloons because it could unbalance the load and he'd fall out of his chair. So he stayed up there, <laughs> drifting, <laughs> cold, and frightened with his beer and sandwiches for 14 hours. And he crossed the primary approach corridor for Los Angeles International Airport. A Transworld airline was descending to land. And the pilot looked out of the window and saw Larry <laughs> in his garden chair looking terrified with his sandwiches and his beer and his popcorn. <laughs> Eventually, Larry had the courage to shoot a few balloons and slowly he descended. <laughs> and as he came down, the whole, contra the whole contraption caught up in a power line, blocking out electricity for the Long Beach neighborhood for 20 minutes. Larry finally climbed out to safety where he was arrested. <laughs> By waiting police, as he was led away with handcuffs with a big smile on his face, <laughs> they said, Larry, you know, Larry, why did you do that? And he said, well, he said, a man just can't sit around. <laughs> and you know what? Well, you know what? The one thing I love, give it up for Larry Waters. I mean, the guy was amazing. A man can't just sit around. You see, Larry had a dream. <laughs> and come hell or high water, he was going to make sure that dream was realized. And do you know what I've learned in my life? Very often, you can't just leave it all to God. Very often, there's something that we have to cooperate with God to do to see our dreams fulfilled. Somebody say amen in this house right here. Uh, let me read you something else. Uh, you know, the, there's nothing on the TV tonight, so this is cool. So, so my PA, I I'm just want to inspire you tonight. That's all I want to do. You know, I, uh, my PA, she sent me this uh, letter. Her husband wakes, works for the Jaguar company. And uh, she sent me this email, and it was dated the 1st of March, 19. 68. It wasn't an email, it was a letter, a fax. Don't ask what a fax is. I, it's a fax. So, so, so this fax was sent by the um, vice chairman of the Jaguar company to a 14-year-old boy called Ian. And Ian had sent some drawings in of cars. He had a dream that one day he was going to design cars. So he sent some sketches into Jaguar, hoping they would take his designs. And, uh, and they, they, you know, they looked at the design. And fair play to this vice chairman. He wrote back to Ian and he said, these are great designs. But, and he gave him some advice about how to develop that dream. That was in 1968. Then... She sent me, this was an email that, that was distributed to all the Jaguar plants around the world in 1999. So that's, take away one. That's the long, a long time later. Uh, I, I, watch this. The Jaguar company today announces the appointment of Ian Callum as director of styling. Acknowledged as one of the leading car designers of his generation, Ian will be responsible for all future Jaguar styling programs. He will also continue to be responsible for the design of all current and future models of the Aston Martin. Give it up for Ian Callum right there, somebody. Just, I, I love these stories. So he was a 14-year-old boy with a dream, and he didn't just sit there. He did something about it. He, he thought, how can, I, how can I develop this? How can I do this? And it's the same 
with the dream that God has placed in your heart. Sometimes you, you have to, you know, uh, you know there's, there's, there's one simple thought I, I, I want to leave with you tonight, and, and, it's, and it's this. One of the main keys to pursuing your dream one of the main keys I have found to pursuing your dream and see it becoming a reality is just give God what you've got in your hand right now. Just give it to him. That miracle of 20,000 people being fed was the result of one little boy saying, I wonder if my lunch can help. Come on, somebody say amen here. And so some of you have a dream in your heart. And you, th you know, I am here today. Um, you know, I've been in the ministry now for <clears throat> 40 years. Uh, and I had a dream. I had a dream when I got saved, when, I, when Jesus came into my life. I, 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 God placed a dream in my heart to see thousands upon thousands of people receive Jesus. And I was, uh, uh, you know, I was saved. I was, in, I was in a rock band in the 60s, and I, I got saved by watching a movie, and I, I went to a local church, and, and I, I just knew there was this dream in my heart. Everybody has got to hear this message, but it seems so far away. There I was in a little church in Wales, about 90 people, and I was there for like 10 years in my 20s. And I had this burning passion to, you know, just to change the world. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I thought God was going to come and, and an angel would appear in my bedroom and say, Ray, how are you? Listen, you know, many people say, oh, I wish an angel would visit me. No, no. Have you ever wondered why every time an angel turned up, the first thing they said to the people was fear not. Have you ever wondered why that is? I mean, give me a break. If an angel turned up and says, you, the first place you'd go is a toilet, I'm telling you right now. So, so I had these, man, what's going to happen with this dream? How am I going to see this a reality? So then I began to realize, well, what do I have right now? What can I use right now? So they asked for volunteers to, to work in children's church. And I didn't know much about it. So I said, yeah, I, I want to volunteer. So, so I, I volunteered for children's church. And, and um, in those days, they had set lessons. So they give you the book. And then you turn up on Sunday. And you teach the kids out of the book. But there was, I, I thought, this is, that's not enough. You know, so what I did, I took the lesson and then I realized, I, I thought of the children that I was going to uh, speak to. So I rewrote out the lesson. I made it, it took me hours upon hours to prepare it. And sometimes I would turn up and there'd be one child there. But you know what? I was as passionate to minister to that one child like, man, I, you know, and, and, and I did that for 10 years. And then, you know, just a few years ago, I'm standing on, on a platform. I've just preached a message in a church in South Africa. And I made the appeal for salvation. And I think it was a thousand first-time decisions came forward. They were standing here just praying, and I, and, I, and I pinched myself, and I, I said, Lord, this was the dream. This is what I saw. I, I'm living my dream. And he said, Ray, do you know why you're living your dream? It's because you gave me those lessons all those years ago, and you turned up, and you preached it with the same passion to one child as you preached tonight to thousands. Come on, somebody say amen right here. Give him what you have. And it's been a principle all my life. You know, then I, I went to work in a youth club. And, and uh, so now God promoted me to a youth club. So I had like 120 young people now. So if this, is getting, this is getting closer to what I, I dreamed about. 
So there I was. I worked for a year. And I, I just ministered to them and sang to them and talked to them. And I saw hundreds getting, well, I saw, they were, I saw scores of them getting saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And this was amazing. I thought, Lord, I'm beginning to see my dream come to fruition here. And then one day, a young lad came in and he said, Ray, will you come to my school? And I said, what for? And he said, well, come and sing and speak to the school. I said, no, I don't do that. I, I've never done that before. I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I can say a few things, but the songs, I've only, I only know three Christian songs, and that's not going to go down well in a school with a bunch of headbangers. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I, they said, come on, just come. I, I, I said, okay. So I was so nervous. There's two things you need when you're standing out in the ministry. That's a Bible and a toilet roll, because that's, how it is. So it'll take a while for you to let that sink in. So I go down to the school with my Bible and my guitar, and my toilet roll, and I'm there and I'm terrified. I got 600 kids to speak to. Uh, it's not a Christian, you know, sort of atmosphere. And there's me. And I, <laughs> I, I started to play I, the guitar. I, I learned three chords and I had to watch my hand changing them. And, uh, and I had two terrible songs, Christian songs. Uh, I, uh, there was a song that won the Eurovision Song Contest eight years ago called Hallelujah, Praise the Lord. I thought, oh, they will love this. So I, I got that one. And then I used to sing a song by the Everly Brothers called Bye Bye Love. Remember that? Bye Bye Love. I changed the words. This is so corny, it's ridiculous. I changed the words to be relevant. I thought, I'm, I'm going to be relevant. So I cha changed the words from bye-bye love to bye-bye sin. How corny is that? Bye-bye sin, bye-bye loneliness. I mean, it was rubbish. So I had hallelujah, praise the Lord, and bye-bye sin. To sin to these 600 headbangers. Into death metal. So, so I was terrified. So, I, so no, they introduced me. It's, 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 but that's all I had. I could have said to God, come back when I know some better songs, when I can play the guitar a bit better, and when I know a bit more. But God says, no, Ray, give me what you have now. But I said, they're enough songs. Listen to them. You know, when someone says to me, God gave me the song, I say, yeah, you know why? Because he didn't want it. Anyway, so, 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 so I had two of them songs. I say, God gave me them songs, yeah, because he didn't want them. So he gave them to me. So I, I walk on the stage, right? 600 headbangers. Teenagers ranging between 13 and 18. And me, I come out with my Christian guitar. A furry strap with God loves you all over the, the crosses. I wanted that guitar to be sanctified. There's no way I'm going in there unsanctified into this hell hole. I wanted to be protected by the great, I, the, I, the furry and the thin and the smile. I had everything. So now, now we have a guest speaker, Ray. So I, I walk on, right? It's all you could hear. It was quiet. I went up, I looked at them and said, well, hello, children. Children? <laughs> you know when you're nervous, you get it all messed up? Hello, children, because I'm used to speaking to kids. Hello, children. They're like, well, I want you to sing along with this song because I know you're going to love it. It goes like this. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, with one accord. Nothing. They were looking at me like this. There was nothing. And then when that finished, I said, oh, I'm so thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed that song. I, I want you to join in with the next song. Bye-bye, sin. Bye. I went through the whole thing. They were like this. So then I spoke something. I don't know what I said. And then, uh, and then I... I finished, 
There was no reaction at all. Just like we've just seen, we've made contact with another world. <laughs> and so, and it was a hollow wooden stage. So I had to walk off. So all you could hear was me walking off with a toilet roll waiting for me right there. And I'm, th and do you know when I said, do you know when I said, do you know when I said before I left the stage? I'm going to be doing a concert in the gymnasium at one o'clock. How many of you, like, you say things and you, you try to, you're done. And I'm walking off, I go in a concert, what I do? So I'm in a classroom thinking of six ways to kill myself. It was horrible. I walked up, I said, Lord, forget the ministry. This dream, I don't want it anymore. Uh, you can keep it. I don't want it. So one o'clock comes. I'm thinking, well, nobody's going to turn up anyway. So what are you worried about? So I turn up to the gym. It was packed <laughs> to the gills. I thought I was in the wrong place. Seriously, I walked in. They're all there. I said, oh, sorry. Could you tell me where the gymnasium is, please? The guy, the guy in the front said, it's here. So I did the whole thing again. That's all I knew. It was my bread and fish. Well, hello, everybody. I know you know this song. I sang it. Let's sing it together. Hallelujah. Pete. Nothing. Oh, thank you for joining. Here we go. You know this one. Bye-bye. Sing. And I spoke something about the love of Jesus. <clears throat> and then to finish, I just wanted to go. I wanted to go. I wanted to hide. I wanted to become a rabbit, find a hole. I, you know what I'm saying? I said, Lord, I didn't think the ministry was like this. I, th I thought everybody would love me and think I'm great. So and then to finish, this is what I said. Okay, everybody, I want you to bow your eyes and close your head. I'm thinking if you could, if you could do, if you can do that, you should join the circus. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm thinking, oh, this is going bad now. Lord, why did you do? So I said, if you want to receive Jesus, I I, I didn't know how to. Do, so I just did the best I could. Put your hand up. Fifty percent of them put their hand up. I said, no, you didn't understand what I just said. <laughs> I went through it again. This time, 75% put their hands up. Revival broke out in that school. And I've met men, depressingly, in their 50s, who were there that day. <laughs> I've met people... Revival broke out in that school. The headmaster, I didn't know this, was a Christian, and he'd been praying for revival in that school for 20 years. And God sent a pathetic hobbit from the Shire with two crap songs and a guitar he couldn't play full of Christian symbols. <laughs> it was all wrong. But you know what? It doesn't matter if it's all wrong. It doesn't matter if it looks like five loaves, two fish will never meet the need. If you are prepared to give it to Jesus, you'll be amazed what he can do with a smile. Come on, somebody, you better say amen in this place. I'm encouraging you. That's how I started. That's how God did it. I just gave him two naff songs and three chords and myself. And then the headmaster, he rung up the youth club where I was working. And he said, look, I've rung up the youth club. I have asked them to release you for a week to stay in the school. 
I want you to go into every classroom. Now I'm really beginning to want the toilet. I said, I, I don't know anything about Egyptology or psychology. He says, no, but you love Jesus, don't you? I said, I love Jesus. He said, I give you permission to go into every classroom and tell these young people about Jesus. I was there for a whole week. You know what? Another school heard about it, invited me. Another school heard about it, uninvited me. But I did learn. I didn't do those songs again. Do you know what I'm saying? I thought, no, no, I've got to get a little bit more relevant. So then I got a little system, a PA system, got some backing tracks. And then for seven years, because the invitations got so many, for seven years, I traveled up and down the United Kingdom, singing and preaching and seeing my dream come to fruition. But you know how it started? I gave God something to work with. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. People are, are praying and fasting and, and, I'm, and, and they, they, I, I, I'm not going to work. I'm giving up my job because I'm going to wait for God. No, man. You've got to start where you are. You've got to start with what you got. I, and I remember in one school in Manchester, man, I began to learn the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, even upon rubbish. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not the material, it's the one who anoints the material. It's not how special you are, or how clever you are, or how gifted you are, it's how anointed you are. Uh, God doesn't anoint who you want to be. Some of you are just wishing you could be like somebody else. Some of you are thinking, if only I could sing like Kirsty. Some of you are thinking, if only I could be as good looking, as well built as Ray Bevan. Some of you are thinking, some of you are thinking, if only I could be. No, listen, God doesn't anoint who you want to be. He anoints who you are. I, when I was a young person, when I was a young Christian, I, I, want, I didn't like myself. I, I had an inferiority complex and I wanted to be like somebody else. I wanted to be like Reinhard Bonker. I'm, I'm confessing now. I thought, well, you know, R.B., Ray Bevan, Reinhard Bonker. I said, well, I'm halfway there. I got the initials. And I used to listen to Reinhardt's messages. I used to devour them. Because you know what? One indication of how God wants to use you is who you're attracted to. Is what type of ministry you're attracted to. What type of area you're attracted to. And I was attracted to Reinhardt, obviously because there was a gift in development in me. And I saw that in Reinhardt and I listened to everything he preached. The only problem was I lived in a little village in Wales and I, saw, I started to develop a German accent. Because I wanted to be like him. But I'm Welsh. I used to go down the store in Wales in a little village. And I would go in there and I would say, I want four pounds of potato. <laughs> Excuse me? And I want a three pound of onion and a fire. They're looking at me stupid. I said, what's happened to you, Ray? You need to go and see the doctor. <laughs> Man, thank God I wasn't attracted to young Gicho. I will be speaking a lot of that. Friend, a friend of mine said, Yongi Cho was in a meeting, true story. He was in this meeting and, and Yong, Yongi Cho got up and he had a word of knowledge for people. And this is true. He says, all the people with a constant passion stand up now. It's true. Brian Houston told me this true story. He was there. All the people with a cross of petrol. Stand up now. <laughs> Isn't it? Forty people stood up. <laughs> Do you know what he said then? I lose you now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the atmosphere changed. <laughs> Now, now, see, with my sense of humor, 
with my, with my sense of humor, if I would have done that, I would have said this. If you know you've been healed, bring evidence of healing. <laughs> Not... So, so but, but, but see, we always want to be somebody else. <laughs> and God says, hey, I'm not going to anoint who you want to be. I, I'm, I'm going to anoint who you are. Just give me who you are. Just give me what you have. It could just be a smile. My God, a smile can change somebody's life. I remember my secretary, one of my secretaries, I'm in the, I'm in the office and, um, I, and I'm talking to her and, I'm, and she's, she's typing, right? She's typing like seven million words a minute. Now, you women are amazing people. Oh, I mean, how you can do, you know, you can walk into a room, a woman can be typing, making coffee, she can be planning the uh, next week's uh, budget for the family. And she could be listening to a conversation of four people talking of you at the same time. M women, you, you're amazing. And my secretary, she's typing away and she's, oh, pastor, I wish I had a gift. And I said, really? Oh, yeah. I said, you, she said, you go preaching all over the world. And... Um, and, uh, you know, what am I doing? I got nothing, really. She's typing away, talking to me. She's doing... I said, really? So, you, you, so I said, do you know how I type? I type like this. <laughs> I said, you've been talking to me for 20 minutes. You've typed 14,000 letters, and you're still asking me. What? No, I said, God, I said, I said, the letters that you are typing are helping me do what I do. And I said, you know what? You're going to get the same reward in heaven as I am going to get because we're working together as one body. Come on, somebody. Say amen. It makes no difference. One smile. Man. Oh, time has gone. See, I've been, ch you, you're terrible. You, you make me talk all the time. Are you, I, I, am I? I hope I'm inspiring somebody here tonight just to stop beating yourself up. There are two, this is what the Holy Ghost said to me in the green room here. Before I came out, he said, Ray, there's two classes of people here tonight. He said, there's a group of people, I'm going to ask them, can I borrow their womb? He came to us, do you know we are here as the result of a 17-year-old girl giving birth to a dream. So the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, God is asking you, can he borrow your womb for nine months? He wants to birth something that will change the world. And Mary said this, be it done to me. She didn't say, uh, well, hold on. It's not a good time right now. Um, if 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 you don't if you could go back and tell God that I've just got engaged, and in my culture to go and tell my engaged person that I'm pregnant with child, it's not going to go down very well. No, see, God doesn't wait until your social calendar is okay. God doesn't wait until you've got it all together. That's His choice, not yours. And he comes to Mary and he says, I want to borrow your womb. And Mary said, be it done according to your word. You know what? She signed away her life. When she said that, I mean, she, she, she said it wasn't circumstantially right. It wasn't relationally safe. I mean, she could have been stoned to death by saying yes. She did say yes. She was misunderstood. Don't think it's got to be perfect before God comes to you. And some of you are right in the middle of the worst time of your life. Some of you may be relationally in the worst time of your life. Circumstantially, the worst time of your life. But God says, come on, I want to borrow your womb. Because I want to birth something great from you. And there's a second class of people... And, and I've, I wrote it down here. You've had a chance 
and you've blown it. In the middle of working out your dream, God just told me this, in the middle of working out your dream, in the middle of running your race, something happened. A relationship breakup. A sin that you can't forgive yourself for. An unforeseen tragedy. And you think, that's it for me. I want you to watch a video, a short video. It's only three hours and 16 minutes long. No, it's, only, it's only a couple of minutes long. And for those of you who feel that you've fallen down in the race, for those of you that feel that uh, it's too late for you, watch this video, then I'm going to come back and then I'm going to pray.
Isn't that a great, great <clears throat> visual demonstration of our dad's love for us? Obviously, there are tears flowing here tonight because that is quite an emotional <clears throat> video. It should be. So multiply the love of that dad with a number you cannot write. And that's how much your dad wants you to finish your race. I mean, you, you perhaps, you've broken a hamstring uh, and you're hobbling and you're at the point of, well, I can't do this. And that's where you are right now. And you know what? That's, that's, that's the time that our father breaks through. He can, he, he is here tonight to pick you up, dust you down and say, come on. We can finish this thing together. 